morning. I'm Terry Denson, and welcome to the 50th anniversary of the Florida Watercolor Society and to our virtual convention. Today I'm going to demonstrate something a bit different than you normally see at one of these uh, demonstrations and what I've done in the past. I'm going to go through the painting process from design stage to cleanup and along the way I'm going to show you a number of different tips, techniques, and hacks. Things that will save you time, maybe save you some money. All right, let's start at the very beginning, shall we? Get yourself a ruler that has both centimeters and inches on it because what we're going to do is design or draw a little square that is exactly the same proportions as the painting you want to do. For example, suppose you're going to do it on a piece of 16 by 20 block or a 16 by 20 aqua board. We're going through it the front way here. You can't draw a 16 by 20 and come up with the right, you know, that's pretty big. You want to do a thumbnail of it. So what you can do is exactly proportional Instead of 16 inches, you can pick 16 centimeters. Now, if you look at this, 16 centimeters is pretty big, and 20 is going to be even bigger. That's awfully big for a thumbnail. Suppose you went just one half of that. That would be 8 by 10. And you just use the centimeter ruler, and you draw a rectangle 8 by 10. And if that's still a little too big, half it again. Here you have one that's exactly proportional to a 16 by 20. It's a little too big, which it probably is. Let's go in half again. 4 by 5. And that looks like a pretty good thumbnail size, doesn't it? Now, suppose you're sitting there and you've done your sketch. Uh, and you started out with something about this size and you've done your little sketch and you have a birdie up here and a tree here and it's sitting in it and you decide that you need to crop that down. Well, crop it the way you think you need to and then you can come back and measure it. Oh, well that's four by five and you had started drawing it, say, on a bigger piece of paper. Saves you accuracy. You come up with exactly the right proportions uh, for your thumbnail sketches. Okay, let's move on to the second thing. We're going to do some looking at a computer screen here in a minute, but how many of you have signed up for a workshop? You've gotten the materials list from the artist, and there are some colors on there you've never heard of or you don't have. Let's just suppose that you have gotten the workshop spec sheet or materials list and the artist would like you to bring a tube of Mamer Blue Kubrick Green D, a color you don't have and that you're not familiar with. Well, the easiest way to find out is if you do have it, is to go to one of the URLs for one of the online art supply stores. They'll all have similar information. This one happens to be Cheap Joe's. Go to the Memory Blue Cooper Green Deep page. Scroll down on it and you will see a section that's called More Information. Click on that section and you'll see on it a line that says Pigment and gives you a, a number letter combination. You can see here that the pigment information for Cooper Green Deep is PG7. Well, that doesn't tell you a whole lot, but we can go to one more website and find out what PG7 is. Alright, now let's find out what PG7 is. Let's go to a website called artiscreation.com. And on here you'll see something called the Art 
the color of art site maps. We're interested in pigments, paints, and formulas, and pigments are what the type of paint coloring that we use. Um, and you'll see across the top a number, all the different colors that are represented. Now you can go straight to green and skip all the food or all, or you can click on the highlighted formula and it will show you the entire database, the Color of Art Pigment database. By the way, this is the page that might be best for you to bookmark and you can skip the front pages in this particular website. You'll see, if you scroll down through this, you'll see all the different pigment numbers represented in each of the color families. Uh, you can click it, you can scroll down there and click on the number you want, or you can go up here to the top and click on the color group. Now this is, uh, which is what I just did here, and these are all of the green pigments. Across the top, you'll see what green pigments are identified here and I've highlighted PG7. If you click on PG7 it'll scroll you down the page and here it is and guess what PG7 is thalo green. But take a look at all the different names over at the side. Now some of them you may recognize for example, we know leaf green doesn't look a whole lot like thalo green. With some pigments, everything will work out just fine and you'll find a direct pigment name match for paint that you may have. But you might also find that there are three or four different versions or more, in this case many more, that really don't look a whole lot alike. That's because some of the pigments may be fired differently, uh, may have a slight combination of chemicals that are a little bit different. This is particularly true in the browns and you may find browns that range all the way from burnt umber down through burnt sienna that are exactly the same pigment but each of them has been treated differently. This is the point where you have to use your own judgment and decide if you can match up the pigment or not. Okay, so much for the geeky artist section. Let's move on. Um, does anybody own a brush that looks like this that you accidentally left overnight or somehow in some water? Well, here's a quick fix to, to uh, take care of it. One cup of boiling water just out of the microwave. Quick dip. Smooth it out and let it dry. Shape it just a little. Sometimes this happens like magic and it's almost instant. Other times you have to give it a little bit of a shape. Works well on flat brushes too and you can form them back to a chisel shape. No problem. Okay, let's get this water out of the way because it's very hot. Now, before you head off to that workshop we were just talking about, let me suggest one thing. Take your paint brushes and dip the end of them in a very unique nail polish. These are mine and they have a very sparkly or iridescent kind of silver nail polish on them. I, this is so that if you're sitting here and sharing a table with somebody, your stuff gets mixed up you know which brush belongs to which person. I used to mark mine with blue tape like this. Then I found out about 50% of the people in the room were doing the same thing. Uh, I have a friend who uses iridescent, sparkly, almost unicorn pink colored nail polish. And hers generally stand out quite well. All right, let's move on to a couple of other things. Before you head off to that workshop, you might look and see if that paint that you can't quite, or you think you can match up uh, based on what we just did on the computer, make sure the characteristics are the same. 
If the paint that the artist is asking for is opaque, you need an opaque or granulating. If it's a transparent, you need to match it the same way. If it's definitely non-staining, then take a look and see if the artist is usually one who wants non-staining paints and likes to do a lot of lifting back. That'll make a big difference. All right. I think it's time we dug in the recycle bin. You're going off to a workshop, and you're going to be doing probably, hopefully, things you haven't done before. Now, suppose you think you're going to a workshop where you might be mixing big washes. You need lots of room for a wash. Well, my palette here is my travel palette. doesn't have a whole lot of room. So, I take along some of these. These are, guess what, styrofoam food trays. So once you take the stuff out and you eat it, rinse them off, wash them out, and you have a great auxiliary palette. In fact, some of them come pretty good size. They even have, Lord knows what came in this, but they can come in pretty good sizes. You might also think about yogurt cups and other cups like this. And then one or two of these little puppies. These things come from creamer containers for coffee, like you might get in a cafe, restaurant. They're the perfect size for putting in just a little bit of masking fluid or something that you only need a touch of. Now, what if you think you might need an auxiliary palette and you really hate to buy another one? Or if you're like me, you already have four and none of them are really big enough in the wells for something special? Well, here are two options. This had either tomatoes or peaches in it, I'm not sure which. But it's the kind of packaging that some very high quality produce might come in of the round nature, like I say, peaches or tomatoes. And then here's my prize. This just looks like it's a deviled egg carrier. In reality, this is my palette for casein. This comes, cost me a dollar. And you can get them several places. Uh, this time of year when they're doing clothes out on the summer beach type stuff, uh, or picnic things, you could probably find them for a dollar. I found mine at, the, at one of the dollar stores right after Easter, after Easter was over. Uh, other people have found them, like I said, after vacation. I just use my casein paints in here. I do some mixing here or in one of these trays. Wash it out carefully every time because casein is like acrylic paint. It will turn hard over time. And I can just throw my paints on the top here, the tubes, and store them in this great little carry case that so easily closes up four ways and has its own little carry handle, one dollar. Something else you might want to put together is a toolbox. Yes, a toolbox for artists. This box also costs one dollar. You can get it when school supplies go on sale, they're usually 97 cents for this one at Walmart. I have a number of them. I store, actually store paints in them. This is my box for blues and violets. I have one for reds and greens, one's for browns and yellows, uh, a few whites thrown in. This is a, just a general toolbox. You can also find these at Michael most times of the year, and for some reason they're on sale for a dollar frequently. And then the rest of the time there's some outrageous price. But why do you need a toolbox? Well, there's lots of loose stuff I hope you take with you. One way to get loose, tight paint lids off. This is a nutmeg grater. We'll go into that shortly and explain why you need it. This a small pair of needle nose pliers is so that you can squeeze out the very last bit of paint uh, in a tube and when you get down here to the end 
you can fold it back over and really squeeze it out. So that's a money saver. Of course, a couple of tube, uh, tube paint rollers. Now, here's something worth its money. This is a spare lid for every type and size of paint I have. Why do I have it? Well, there was a while there when my favorite brand of paint, represented by these little black lids here, uh, the lids kept breaking right around the rim. And whenever I had a supply, that was no problem. Um, I could take care of it. Let me see. I have in here a screwdriver, obviously. Any other, a little pocket knife. It doesn't need to be anything fancy. If it's sharp, you can use it to cut open tubes of hardened up paint. Because usually that plug is up near the top, and if you do a slice in it, a T-slice, you can dig out the paint that hasn't hardened up. Of course, scissors. Anything else that you might want to put in it, this is a, uh, a line drawer. And then something I'd like to demonstrate. All right, I have several of these, and they were given to me by banks. This one is from an investment company I used to be with years ago. They're letter openers. If you can find one, they're usually free. They're a handy thing to have because they're a great way to cut paper. Fold the paper, this is 300 pound, right where you want to cut it. Put it in here, get it started, and then just pull. Recycling paper there. The little curve up on the end is easily ironed out. How many of you iron your paintings? I do. If you iron on the back side of a paper with a the back side of your painting face down on your ironing board, steam setting on cotton, which after all the paper is made out of, it does a beautiful job of ironing out any warps in it. That's especially, you know, a problem if you're using 140 pound paper instead of 300. Okay. I would like to now show you something you've heard about, but you may never have seen before. How many times have you heard you should use artist grade paint? Uh, you should use artist grade instead of student grade, and they tell you why. And you say, that's nice, uh, okay, I'll do that and you still have the student grade and you're still using them. Well, let's see what the difference might be. Both of these are alizarin and crimson. This one here on the right is Holbein. This one here is Grumbacher, which is a student grade. Let's see what we can get with it. I'm gonna try to go as close as I can to mass tone. But just look at the color on the palette. Mm, pretty color. I'm not sure how much of a dark you could get if you mixed it with a green. Now here's the Holbein. Tell me which one you think has more pigment in it. makes a big difference, especially if you're trying to get a rich, deep color. Let's take a little green. Take a little more green and mix in this. Well, not quite getting to black, is it? Bit of a difference in color, isn't there? Okay, I have two more cheap artist tricks up my sleeve. Have you priced a gator board backing board for a piece of watercolor paper lately? Well, if you're real lucky, you can find a ceiling tile. 
Uh, I've taped the edges some years back with um, duct tape. And it works just like a nice gator board. You can staple down into it. You can see the lines where I did it. Lift the staples back out with a silver knife underneath. Uh, you might be able to buy a single one at one of the big box hardware stores. Um, if you know somebody in the construction industry, that makes it nice too. Uh, what other goodies do we have here? Here's an interesting one. I'll demonstrate this one in a little bit. But this is a spatter screen. It's made out of a 59 cent plastic embroidery hoop and a piece of window screening. And it works just as well as the $10 one. Okay, and what else? Do we oh, one last one. How many of you have those plastic 97 cent tablecloths that you put down on tables? I've used a lot of them. But what I found is they're not really waterproof. Stuff will seep through them. I'm not too sure why. But I found an excellent alternative. And that is a shower curtain liner, white one. Costs about three bucks. Doesn't leak ever. It's washable. Throw it in the washing machine. Okay, let's take a look at a couple of other things. Mm, this one's just a minor tad bit geeky. But how many of you might own more than one brand of the same color? There was a time when I had about three or four shades of cobalt blue. And believe you, none of them were the same. One way to keep track of what you have and to actually make it easier for you to select a color palette for a painting is to take a piece of watercolor paper, preferably 300 pound, and cut it to the size of a business card. Run a black strip across it, a um, heavy wide black marker. Now, for every single paint that you own, whatever the cue is, and even if you've got four different shades or four different versions or brands of the same paint, take that paint, rub it, at mass tone right here. And then start watering it down slowly. Until you see what it looks like when you bring it out to the lightest of washes. That tells you several things. As it dries, you'll be able to tell if it's granulating or not. You certainly can tell right away whether it's opaque or not, or if it's only opaque in mass tone. When it dries a little, you can take a brush right in here and try to lift it back, and you'll be able to determine whether it's staining or not. Uh, this is too wet to do that right now. Now, each one of those I will label right here, uh, that is Holbein. I just use an H. You can use a DS for Daniel Smith or an MG or whatever. I write the name right here, Permit Alizarin Crimson. Put the light fastness here. It's a Roman numeral one. And I can tell by looking at it whether it's staining or granulating. The other thing you might want to do after looking at that computer section is write the pigment number right here. Now, this is Holbein. Holbein in, doesn't put the pigment number on it unless it's in Japanese. So that's one you have to look up. Most of them, though, will have that pigment number on it. Take every one of these and organize them how you will. I always organize mine by color family. And then put them into one of these binders. These are business card holders. And they come in packages of 10. So that's why I cut this card business card size. 
and all the blues will be on one page or pages. There's 10 compartments, which means you can put in 20 samples because you can put the back in as well. If you want, you can put any notes on the back of it that you might want. For example, on this one, this is Holbein's Cobalt Genuine. And I wrote the pigment number, PB28. Um, what I did for the others, ultramarine blue, what it might be, PB29. Some of the cobalt's hues may be a mixture of two different colors. So that's just a handy trick. And for, for a number of years, I actually sat down, this was some years back, and decided what kind of color scheme I was going to use and went through and picked the particular paints I was going to use. Some more drawing things. In your toolbox or a box of other types of things that you might keep, like your masking fluid and salt and dish soap, you might want something that will act as a crayon, as a wax resist. And you can go steal the white crayon out of your kid's crayon box and they will be very angry with you. Uh, and then you have it right there, you have a nice one. But if you want to spare the kids, or you can't find a crayon, or a birthday candle, which also works, try a white china marker works just as well. Lasts a lot longer. You can find them in any office supply section. Let me show you something that you can do. You remember this little nutmeg grater? I said I'd show you what it was worth later on. Well, all you have to do, if you want to lay down some texture or pattern color, is put clean water just where you want it. This might be inside one shape of leaf, uh, one area, or whatever. Then you take your nutmeg grater and one of these watercolor crayons and just grate on it, knock it down, put it as much or as little as you want. Don't worry about going over top the area you wet. It's not going to stick to anything but the wet area. Let's add a little yellow to this. And maybe just a touch of orange. Okay. right there and nowhere else. Don't be too tempted to rub it if it's, you've got a piece or two left on the outside. When it dries, you can brush that right off. Interesting way to do it. Just remember to wash this at the end of the, each grading session that you do. And like all good texturing, don't overdo it. Okay. Now, you probably all have used saran wrap and stuff like that as a watercolor texturing medium, right? Way, you know, what else do we normally use? Let's put some paint down here. Well, here's one you can try as well. This is a used dryer sheet. Give it a good crumple. It gives a texture that's more subtle than is the um, saran wrap. Push it down, blot it. In fact, it often comes out looking a lot like stucco. Leave it there, push it down as much as you want, let it dry just like you do the others, and then pull it up. And I'll show that to you once we let it good and get good and dry. The graded crayons you can put on top of any color, use any way that you want. Well, let's get going. We only have a few more things to do before this is over. And I'm sure you've seen enough geek stuff so far today. I, I told you 
I would demonstrate this and let me do that. This is a piece of window screen when we rescreened our pool. Um, they sell these, I know, at the big box art stores. Cheap Joe says what you're supposed to do is take your paint and put on the screen like this. Then take a brush and And that didn't do all that good. I have done better with this. Cheap Joe says take your brush and put paint on the screen. I like to get it on good and heavy. I guess you can put on as much as you want. I find digging in helps. Different heights give different sizes. So play with it. Not sure it works all that well, but you can easily make one. And I don't have much experience with this. I don't splatter this way. But you may find it useful, especially if you can get a hold of a piece of small window screen. Um, this down here is what the graded watercolor crayon looks like when it was dried. This over here is the dried section where we put the piece of crumpled up dryer sheet, used dryer sheet on it. The darker spots are where I press down a little heavier. You can do that, move it around, and it'll give you more texture. I've used this to create what looks like a stucco wall using a couple different earth tones, and you can layer it that way. You can also come in and augment the creases and things that are, you know, these patchy looking things. All right, let's move on to the last quick two sessions because I know you're probably wondering how much more information can be thrown at you today. Okay, I have a question for you. What does Coastal Fog Mint Julep Complo Compose Blue, Compose Green, uh, John Brillant, Br Brilliant, Blue Gray, Brilliant Pink, Shell Pink, lavender have in common and about a dozen other colors. What they have in common is one pigment, titanium white, PW6. It's a major component of every single one of them. This is coastal fog. Hope you can see it on the screen here. It's titanium white and it says brown iron oxide. The browns can be difficult because most all browns are made from brown iron oxide. There are just some of them that have a few other, the different color depends on how hot they were cooked at and what other minerals might be in the deposit from which they were mined. But I bet you could have fun playing around with your browns and try to come up with coastal fog. My guess is it's burnt umber, but I don't have any of that on my palette. What I do know is most all of the titanium white colors can be duplicated. Let's uh, take mint julep, which is, stole my brush. Mint julep is titanium white, of course. and phthalo green with a touch of yellow. So if you're looking for a pastel -y looking color, you could probably make almost any one that you want yourself. Uh, lavender, let's clean this a little, is 
ultramarine blue, uh, ultramarine violet and white, and I don't have any ultramarine violet, but let's try a couple of the others here. Uh, white with a bit of pyro red in it and a little bit of orange and you have shell pink. I have a sheet here I'm going to post up on the screen in a minute that gives you the pigments in a sampling of about eight different colors. There are far more of those. You now know how to find out what the pigments are and what the pigment names are if you decide that you want to pursue mixing your own colors and saving buying those six or eight different paints. Um, just to experiment, why don't we take a little white and I don't have ultramarine blue, but I do have carbazole violet, which is quite strong, so we'll just be careful with it. And ultramarine blue. And a little more violet. And I'll bet we have something quite similar to the lavender. More white in it and a richer pigment will give you that more of a chalky look. Now, you could probably use the other whites, gouache or casein, but the titanium white watercolor is more of the same consistency of the watercolor paints that you will be using. So you may find that works a little bit better. The gouache is so flat uh, looking that it may not, it may stand out more. Casein will probably work okay. It's not quite as flat. Okay, let's look at one other paint besides titanium white. And what I have here is Lunar Black. Lunar Black is marketed by Daniel Smith and might be marketed by a couple of others as well. Did you catch that? You got paint up sticking above it a little, squeeze down below at the side and watch the paint go back down in again. Now, Daniel Smith markets two colors uh, that are a combination of lunar black and transparent colors. He has several other lunar colors too, but they're ground up earth pigments. The one that he has is thalo blue and lunar black. Let's put a little more blue in that. So why am I telling you about this paint? Because a granulating paint, super granulating like the Lunar Black, very coarse, mixed with a transparent paint, they're going, to, they're going to separate out. You will still have the color that you started with. Your transparent paints are usually stronger, but the black will sink out and you can see it happening here already and it gives you a very textured paint. They also sell ultramarine lunar violet, which is an ultramarine blue, also already kind of uh, granulating, mixed with the lunar black, and it comes up with a nice neutralized violet that has this sedimentation in it. I think they're both good, especially the violets, kind of nice for rocks or distant hills or something like that. But you can take any color, any transparent color, not just transparent, but any mostly transparent colors, and that lunar black, and mix them together. And create your own version. Let's put a little more 
Watch it separate already. Create some interesting textures. In fact, you don't have to have lunar black. You can mix any granulating paint, very granulating paint, with a transparent paint and come up with some great combinations. Let me see, where is, what do we have here? Yellow ochre, ha, huh. raw sienna by Daniel Smith. That one's so full it doesn't want to go back down in. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to take a little bit of this raw sienna and mix it with phthalo green. Phthalo green? Yeah. Let's make it a little stronger. That looks wimpy. Now these um, permanent or, or uh, the transparent colors you're using are strong. So it usually only takes a little bit of them compared to the granulating paints which tend to be more earth tone. This is the combination of burnt sienna and phthalo green. You can vary that with more green or whatever. Daniel Smith calls this cascade green. In fact, there are quite a few paints out there that are combinations of two or, or more, two or three different pigments. That is, they're very easily duplicated. So you might play around with it. It might be too geeky for you, but if you find yourself looking for just the right color and you don't have it, or if you want to add a little texture or interest, might be fun. All right, one last section and we're through here. Clean up. You're ready to go home. That workshop is over. Nice. One thing you need to do is every time, I didn't open that one, every time you've used a paint tube for the day, open it up and wipe it down before you put it away. Wipe the threads like this, even if you might take a little damp towel to it. Clean off the threads. If there's a pile in here, clean that out in the, in the lid. This will keep your paint cap screwed on more, more tightly um, and will help prevent the paints from drying up in the tube, especially the, uh, the coarser paints or the dirt paints. And every so often, dig out a toothbrush, take all your paints over the water, stick, take the caps off, scrub the threads down under water, clean out the caps, dry them off and put them away. It'll make your paints last a lot longer. Now you still have all those brushes to clean up. With watercolor, it's usually not too much of a problem. A good swash around in clean water. But occasionally, if you're using something else, the brush might get a little stiff. And I have found that the, the best brush cleaner I have used so far, and I've bought three or four different brands, is Murphy's Oil Soap. Uh, it also works on the cabinets, too, when I get around to them. Take the um, a small container like this, stick your paint in it and pour in just enough to bring the soap up to the bottom of the ferrule. Now I've not tried it on dried up liquid acrylics, but I have tried it on my brush that I use for varnishing the uh, aqua board. And it's gotten kind of stiff and still had old varnish in it. And you had to beat it a little bit to get it, you know, soft enough. Well, I soaked it in it for about half an hour in the Murphy soap. Came out beautiful. So, probably more than you wanted to know, and I could probably come up with a few more. I promise not to do it yet. 
So thank you all for coming to the Florida Watercolor Society's virtual convention. Uh, I ask you all to take care of yourself and keep well. And we hope we'll see each other in 2022.